Good morning, brothers and sisters at Middleburn. Greetings in the Lord. Welcome to your second Sunday back in your building. And as I come to you on the big screen, I want to pick up where we left off last week. But first, let me show you how much I appreciate the open door that you've extended to me. First, it was extended by the Lord to preach the gospel, but you have been so kind to continue extending these opportunities to me to share these messages from the Word of God. I would ask you to get your Bibles and open back up to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read verse 24 in just a few moments. But if you were listening last week to the big picture of the Bible and you weren't fully convinced, maybe as a, an unbeliever, somebody who's never called upon the Lord to be saved, you weren't fully convinced by what we shared. I hope that this week is the final encouragement that you need to make that decision and to commit your life to Christ. Maybe you're listening and you are a member of the church and you were, you know, found the, the message very helpful as a tool for your work in evangelism and you thought, well, I can share this, but I need just a little bit more. What more could I share to help someone come to understand the one gospel and become a believer in Jesus. We're going to talk about that today in a message that is titled, Four Testimonies to the One Gospel. Again, I give credit to Ken Craig for the material, but it is certainly something that accompanies and serves as a compendium to the message that we shared last time. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go ahead and jump right in as we study Four Testimonies to the One Gospel. The first testimony to the One Gospel is what the apostles taught. And what we're going to find is that the power of the apostles' teachings will ring true with everything that we shared last time. If you remember, in Galatians 3.24, the Bible says that the old law was our teacher, our tutor, or our schoolmaster, depending on which version you're using. That teacher was to bring us to Christ so that we could be justified by faith. Again, I want to emphasize as we talk about all the things that we do today, that we are justified. We are made right with God by faith. But as we pointed out last time, faith is accompanied by works. It is obedience from the heart that we must offer to God in order to have that salvation. How do we know this? Well, in Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 22, here's what we read. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Again, we're just simply believers. But what is included in that belief? It says, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified, that is, made right with God by faith. Now keep reading. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In other words, the old law is not our guide, is not our teacher anymore. But the Bible says you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But how does this happen? How or when does the Bible say that God views me as justified by faith. When am I a son or a daughter of God by faith? Well, if you keep reading in the text, the answer is right there. And we didn't cover this last time, but it's gonna, we're going to build on what we studied together last time. He goes on and he says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So there's our answer. We must be baptized into Christ in order to clothe ourselves with Christ, to be covered by Christ. And we find that this is what it was explaining in the text, being justified by faith or becoming a believer are those who have been baptized into Jesus. And we can see it right there plainly in the text. So how is it that we're made right with God? How is it that we're brought back into a good relationship with God? We call this justification and reconciliation. When does the gavel come down and we are pronounced not guilty, we are considered righteous? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 24, being justified as a gift by His grace. Again, it is a gift and it is by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. But what do we need to know about that grace and what do we need to know about that faith? Well, it says in Colossians 2, 8 to 12, for in Him, fo focus on the phrase in Him, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It's talking about Christ. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And notice, 
in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. What is Paul talking about here? We know that the removal of skin in the Old Testament is what caused one to become a, a, a Jew, one who could be recognized as one of God's people. What is he talking about? In Christ we were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What circumcision does Christ have? Well, notice what it says. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised up with him. Don't miss this. We were raised, buried with him and raised up with him. Now keep reading. Through faith in my works, did I merit the salvation? No, it says it's through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so we know that just as Christ didn't come up out of the grave on his own power, but it was the Lord who opened the, the grave, God who opened the grave through the Spirit, and the angels descended, and there was this grand scene. It was all in the working of God that those things took place. And so we find out that our resurrection will be the same way, but we don't say that we did it under our own power or on our own merit. It is simply by faith. But faith includes obedient works from the heart. Now let's keep reading. If we talk about putting our faith in God's work, notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. But by, do, by his doing, whose doing? Not mine. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, there's three of our big terms, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. How did we obtain those things? Not on my own good works, but it was by his doing. So when we enter into the waters of baptism, we are putting our faith in God's work. And then another familiar passage that we can add to our little supplemental material is in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, where the Bible confirms corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Now, there are multitudes of denominations out there who will tell you baptism has nothing to do with salvation. But Peter makes it blatantly clear. Keep in mind, he was the one who stood up on Pentecost and he preached repentance and baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Now understand that he says corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. We're not taking a bath and we're worried about the, the film or the dirt that could be on our skin. We're talking about the removal of sin. How does that happen? Well, it says it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. When do I make that appeal? when I am buried in the waters of baptism. That's why Peter says, baptism now saves you. And it goes on in the text to tell us, again, it's through faith in the working of God. Who was the one that resurrected the Christ? It was God that did that. And so we're putting our faith in the working of God. We can see the, the correlation between these two texts that we just read a moment ago. Now, the Bible says when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he canceled out the certificate of debt, having nailed it to the cross. And it's referring to the old law and all the sins that had been committed under that law. He nailed it all to the cross. And we showed this illustration last time, talking about how we're buried as an old dead man into sin and buried into Christ's death. And then we're raised to walk in the newness of life. So if we're buried with him in baptism and it's through faith, when we were dead, we were made alive, according to the text of the scriptures. Notice the correlations between what we studied last time in Romans 6 and now what we're reading in Colossians 2. The Bible is one harmonious message of salvation. It is the gospel, the gospel, and it must be taught this way in order to be accurate. F.F. F. Bruce, who is a scholar on the languages of the New Testament, he said of baptism and faith, In apostolic times, baptism appears to have followed immediately on confession of faith in Christ. Why? Notice, the repeated accounts of baptism in Acts give ample proof of this. What is expressly related in Acts is implied in the epistles. Faith in Christ was an essential element in baptism. For without it, the application of water, even accompanied by the appropriate words, would not have been Christian baptism. You see, faith makes it work. Why do we do this act of going into water, being immersed in it, and then raised up out of it? It's not because we're just trying to get wet or go for a swim. Jesus taught us, the apostles taught us, this is how we come in contact with Christ's death and we're raised to walk in the newness of life. God asked people throughout the Old Testament to do all kinds of things to represent their faith. 
Naaman was told to wash seven times in the Jordan River in order to get rid of leprosy. What does water in the Jordan River have to do with cleansing leprosy? It didn't work for necessarily anybody else. It's because God commanded it that made it work. And by faith, we put our trust in him and we do exactly as he says. So washing is the figure of baptism. How do we know that? Well, in Acts 22 and verse 16, when the apostle Paul was converted, he was Saul at the time. He became Paul after his conversion. Here's what he was told by Ananias in Acts 22, 16. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. Why? Is it an outward sign of an inward grace, as many of the denominations teach? Is it just a symbol of our already being saved? Notice. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. People say all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord to be saved. What does the text teach here? In order to call on his name, it must be through the act of baptism. That's our time of appeal to God for a good conscience. And we ask him to wash away our sins by the blood of Jesus. It's no power in the water. It's simply our faith in God and the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all of our sins. And that's why he goes on to say, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's in his blood that we're washed. But the figure of baptism is what brings us to the point of being clean when we are washed from our sins. And then to bring this point home, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, when Paul describes a list of sins that would keep someone out of heaven, he says, such were some of you, but you were washed. There's that figure of baptism. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in or by the Spirit of our God, depending on which translation you use. But again, there's a couple of our terms. Sanctified, what does that mean? To make holy or to consecrate for holy purposes. To be justified, to be brought back into a right relationship with God, to be brought back in line with God. Where does that begin? It begins with a washing, and that washing is baptism where we come in contact with the blood of Jesus and the power of his blood washes away our sins. Don't miss these points as we're outlining them here in the New Testament. So God was creating a holy people, and we know that holy people to be spiritual Israel or his church today. And we find how that people was created. It says in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now watch, so that he might sanctify her, again, setting her apart. For what and by what means did he set us apart? It says that he washed us clean, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory. It takes a washing to get us to that point. Do you not see that? And what would happen? That we would have no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be, or that she would be, holy and blameless. There's two more of our terms. But how do we get to that point? We have to be sanctified by the washing of water. And then we go to Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. And we find here, for we, we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Well, what happened? But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Who saved us? Did I do it? No, we talked about this earlier. He saved us. How? Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Remember what it said earlier that Christ gave himself? It was a gift, but it's still something, there's still something that you and I must do to be regenerated and to be renewed. It's still according to his mercy and his grace, but watch this. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Regenerating something is bringing something dead back to life. Renewing something is taking something that is old and making it new. And we find that our renewal and our regeneration happens when we're washed in baptism and when we are renewed by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by my works, no, that's not what it said. So that being justified by his grace, 
we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's how it happens. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, again, it says, But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. That's when we're united with Christ in the likeness of his death in baptism. The dead man, in essence, then, is buried. And he's crucified with Christ, buried with Christ into death, so that what? We might be sanctified. Our sins are removed. We're made holy and righteous. And then we, then we have what we call justification, where the penalty is removed and we're brought into a right relationship with God, which ultimately makes us reconciled. We are in a relationship with a holy God. It is restored and made right. And then in Titus 3, 5, we'll revisit that text moment for just a moment. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. This describes the entire process from the time that we're dead in our sins to the time that we are alive in Christ. And what we refer to this renewing by the Holy Spirit is the moment when he scrubs us in the waters of baptism. He has that work. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us is he renews us in the waters of baptism. And the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. How does that salvation happen? Notice what it says. Through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. There are a lot of people who will teach that it's just faith in the truth, but there's a work of the Holy Spirit that takes place in the moment of our surrender in baptism that we can't do by ourselves. God does it all. It's all Him. Whatever we do is simply by faith in the truth, and then God takes over, and it's His work that renews us. So it's still a gift. It's still by His grace. It's still by His mercy. See also 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. Here we see God's role in redemption. In that one text in Titus 3, we find God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all interacting to work on our behalf to bring about redemption. It is not something that you and I can merit or do on our own. And it is also a gift. It is undeserved. Christ died for the ungodly while we were still in our sins. But notice here in this text, it's not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. That doesn't change the requirement that God has put in the word of God, which by faith we must accept and do the things he's asked us to do. And then it says we are justified by his grace. You can see this language all throughout the text. But why in the heart of the passage would it tell us to be renewed and to be regenerated through a washing? Well, here's the answer. In a list of cardinal teachings in the New Testament that Paul makes in Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, we find something very unique and interesting. It says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body. We all understand that. It's the church. There's one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that is of heaven when you were called. One Lord, one faith. We're all in agreement up to this point, right? But let me ask you this. What is one baptism doing on a list of all of these cardinal teachings that we find in this book of Ephesians? Why does Paul include one baptism on the list? And which baptism is he referring to? Is it Holy Spirit baptism? Or is it the baptism into water for the remission of our sins? We'll find out in just a moment what this is talking about. If you go into the New Testament and you find out what the apostles practiced, we can also gain another piece of our supplemental material that will help us to share the gospel or to accept it for ourselves. Maybe you're listening and you're thinking, this is really starting to make sense to me now. I'm ready to make a decision or I'm almost there. What more can you tell me? Well, we're going to look at the power of actual examples that we read about in the New Testament. What shall we do is the question that was asked on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus. It says, now when they heard this, that is the preaching of Peter, they were pierced to the heart. So this is the first gospel sermon on Pentecost. Now notice, they believed the gospel. It pricked their hearts. They wanted to know what do we have to do. They were convinced. But what happens here is very important. And, and, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now, Peter did not say, do. There is nothing you can do. Christ did it all. He didn't say, just believe. He didn't say, call on the name of Jesus or call out Jesus' name. He didn't say, 
pray the sinner's prayer. He didn't say pray through. He didn't say accept Jesus into your heart or come to the mourner's bench and you can continue on and on with all the answers you're going to get when people say, what do I have to do to be saved? What was his response? These are different gospels that we read here. But what was Peter's response in the passage? We'll continue reading and you'll see. Brethren, what shall we do? He said, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is the gospel answer. This is the one gospel that we've been talking about throughout the last two messages together. And so the gospel result of obedience to these words is that you're added to the church. It says, And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Well, how do I be saved from the perverse generation? Well, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Notice it doesn't say they were added prior to being baptized. They were added to the number of believers after they had been baptized. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those that were being saved. To be saved, we must obey the gospel. Now, in Acts chapter 8, another example that's very powerful, where Philip is preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. If you'll join me there, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And they went along the road, and they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Was he saved when he made that confession? Let me also add that if Philip is preaching Jesus to him, how does he know about baptism? Apparently, baptism is a subject that you preach about when you're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he was interested in doing those things. Certainly, Philip must have said something. And so it says, And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. Do you know what he was rejoicing about? He had just been told about Jesus and how through his blood we can be saved if we'll only come in trusting faith and be baptized. He wanted to do it. He expressed his belief. They stopped the chariot. He was baptized. And now he was a child of God. That's why he went on his way rejoicing. Notice it says he preached Jesus to him. In the process, he taught him about being baptized. And now he could go on his way rejoicing. The one baptism of Ephesians 4 is clearly demonstrated in the book of Acts. It is water baptism for the remission of sins. From those two examples in Acts 2 and 8, we learn the following. Baptism was for believers. It has one subject. Baptism was for the remission of sins, which means it has one purpose. Baptism was immersion in water. It had one mode. There's no other modes that can be accepted. Baptism added one to the kingdom or the church. It had one result. And therefore, we see baptism was commanded and was not a promise. This is not the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as in the baptism of the Spirit, but it is the baptism in water as the Lord commanded for the remission of sins through the Apostle Peter. What about saving Paul? We always talk about the, you know, the Roman road or Paul's salvation. This comes up often. When was Paul saved? He was already a God-fearing man. He was raised to be a God-fearing man. But whenever the Lord appeared to him on the road as he was about to go persecute Christians, we learn some things about this, this story. First of all, he believed because he said in that moment, what shall I do? Just like those Christians or those people on in Acts 2 before they became Christians, what shall I do? And then it says that he confessed, what shall I do, Lord? He recognized that he was talking to the Lord in that moment. And it says that he obeyed, get up and go into Damascus. So is he already saved at this point? Well, it says that he fasted for three days and he neither ate nor drank in his time of, of thinking about what the Lord shared with him. And it says that he prayed. He was, he was praying, Ananias was told, when he was going to go meet with him. So when we think about saving Paul, he's repented for three days. He's basically acknowledged who the Lord is. He's trying to follow the initial steps that God gave to him through, through the Lord. And what we find is... After all of these acts of repentance, 
Paul was commanded, listen, now why do you delay, get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name? So if Paul was saved at any point prior to his baptism, that means that he was saved while he was yet in his sins, because here he is told by Ananias to wash away his sins in the act of baptism. This is very important. Because there are some people who would say that the moment he confessed that the Lord was talking to him, that he was saved. Or after he repented for three days, he was saved. No, it's not until he obeys this command in order to be saved. Now, some people will say, why do we get so many different answers to one question? If you think about where you are right now, if you were in um, in Moundsville or in Middleburn and you say, how far is it to Wheeling? You're going to get different answers. Well, this particular lesson was shared when I was in Bryson City, and you look at Bryson City, uh, Bryson City, North Carolina. Excuse me, I forgot where I was. And and it tell how long is how far is it to Knoxville, Tennessee, from Bryson City? Well, it's eighty four point three miles. Well, how far is it to Lexington, Kentucky, from Bryson City? It's two hundred and fifty four miles. How far is it to Chillicothe, Ohio from Bryson City? Well, it's 439 miles. Why do we bring this up? This is not a lesson in in geography or anything like that. The answer to the question depends on where the person is when they ask the question. So when we go to the New Testament and we see some passages like Acts 16, which say, believe on the Lord and you will be saved. Or if we go to Acts 2, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Or in Paul's case, it said, just be baptized. Why is this? Well, it depends on where you are. What must I do to be saved? Well, if you consider, again, the Macedonian jailer in Acts 16, he was a complete unbeliever, so he was told to believe on the Lord and he would be saved. But they were baptized as well. We also find that in Pentecost in Acts 2, they had already believed, what shall we do? And they confessed, but what did they need to do? They needed to repent and be baptized. And then Paul, he believed and he confessed and he repented for three days. What did he still have left to do? Well, he needed to be baptized and wash away his sins. So these are not contradictory passages. The apostles that are preaching and teaching to them are meeting them where they are and leading them down the road to salvation. A third testimony to the gospel that we have been talking about is what Jesus taught. The power of Jesus' teachings can shed some light on this. You may remember this slide about an urgent and important command that Jesus gave to his disciples before he left the earth. And we only shared the first part of it in our last lesson, so we could add emphasis here and take us a little further. The Great Commission says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, what does it say next? It says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who has not believed shall be condemned. Let me remind you, These are the words of Jesus our Lord before he left the earth. And his teaching was, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He also saw the importance of being baptized. We are are brought into a relationship with God through that step of coming in contact with the blood of Christ. In John 3, 5, when Jesus teaches about being born again, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water and the Spirit. What is that talking about? Well, if you remember from Titus 3, 5, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. There's the connection. It's water and the Spirit. We enter the waters in submission to the gospel, and the Holy Spirit does his work of cleansing us, making us whole so that we can be in a right relationship with God. And the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is harmonious with what we just read. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Disciples are followers and learners. Make learners or disciples of all the nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we must understand that Jesus' teachings are in harmony with those of the apostles and what we read in the New Testament. Now, what about what the early church taught and practiced? We'll spend just a brief moment on this. Barnabas in 70 AD wrote, Blessed are they who, placing their trust in the cross, have gone down in the water. We indeed descend into the water full of sins and defilement. However, we come up bearing fruit in our heart, having the fear of God 
and the trust of Jesus in our spirit. And that was in the epistle of Barnabas, chapter 11. And that was written right after, right around the turn of the first century. Irenaeus in 150 AD said, As we are lepers in sin, we are made clean from our transgressions by means of the sacred water and the invitation of the Lord. We are thus spiritually regenerated. He used that term. We are thus spiritually regenerated as newborn infants, even as the Lord declared, except a man be born again. Just in case you were wondering how they interpreted that text in John 3 around the turn of the first century. It's a very good proof text. So let's, talk, let's kind of summarize everything, and the lesson will be yours. When we think about the plan of redemption following the death, burial, and, and resurrection of Christ, in the, in the plan of re- redemption, we see these things. The Great Commission, what Christ commanded, was that we believe and be baptized. Then we also see in the book of Acts the actual things that took place in the New Testament. We see apostles carrying out this work, and people are being baptized in every single case of conversion. And then we also see the epistles, which is what was taught by the apostles, and it's also in harmony with the need for being baptized into Christ. And then we read what the early church had to say. In other words, the practices that continued after the time of the apostles, and we see that they also practiced these things. Brothers and sisters and friends, everyone deserves the opportunity to accept or to reject the gospel. Again, if you're listening and you're not in Christ, today's your day. You have an opportunity to accept or reject this message before it leaves your heart, before it leaves your mind, and you no longer see it as an urgent need. If you're listening and you are a Christian, you're a member of the Lord's Church, and you realize that maybe you've been slack in your need to spread the gospel, this is your time to revive that fire within you and to understand that everyone deserves this opportunity to say yes or no to the one gospel that was delivered to us for our salvation. We're going to close looking at a couple of verses, Romans 3, 23 to 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this text will never be more clear to you than ever before. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time. Now watch. So that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What does that look like? Well, He's got to be just. Remember, he has to punish wrongdoing, but he will also love and reward those who seek him out. And he's going to be the one who makes us right with him if we'll just put our faith in Christ. And so the question, what can wash away my sins? It's an old song that we sing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're in need of gospel salvation today, you know exactly what you must do. We've studied it together last week and also this week. Now's the time to respond if you need to take advantage of that opportunity. Have you died with Christ? The opportunity is yours to do that. If you're listening today and you are in in Christ, but you've been wandering astray, you've been living a life outside of these wonderful teachings and taking for granted the things that God has done for you through his son Jesus, you also have the opportunity to be restored and ask for prayers from your brothers and sisters. I'm not sure which song has been selected, but as we stand and sing, please make your needs known today. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.